Hey, hey, everybody. I hope you're doing well today. Well, let's take a look at how to draw the neoclassical aggregate demand, aggregate supply diagram. And I'm calling this the rule of 10, which means that there are 10 compulsory things that you need, 10 components that make up the neoclassical aggregate demand, aggregate supply diagram, which is probably going to be your most useful diagram as you move forward through macroeconomics and also into international economics and development economics. The, the, third, the second, third, and fourth components of the IB course syllabus. So let's take a look. All right, so here we go. We got the neoclassical aggregate supply aggregate demand diagram. And what we want to do is we want to make sure that when we're drawing this diagram that we start with the same compulsory elements. And I tell students all the time, look, every time you get an aggregate demand, aggregate supply question, there's going to be the beginning. So where do you start in the beginning? Well, where you start is with this graph, the macro rule of 10, which applies to the neoclassical um, diagram then always there's some sort of event. It could be a supply side shock. It could be an improvement in the, in the quantity and the quality of that factors of production, which is gonna move the long run aggregate supply curve inward or outward. It could be a change in aggregate demand, shifting the ag demand curve outward or inward. But before there's the event, you have to know where to start. And if you get this, these 10 components in your mind, it's a foolproof way, a fail-proof way of making sure that you start off with a perfect diagram. Because we all know if you start off with a bad diagram, your analysis is messed up, and then your evaluation is based on that analysis, which is based on a flawed diagram. So let's take a look at what they are. Very simply, they are, number one, right here, the average price level. Number two, a currency. Number three, PL1, which stands for average price level one. There's a zero at the... Uh, where the vertical and the horizontal axes intersect. There's Y1, which represents the initial equilibrium um, quantity of real GDP. It also represents maybe full, or full employment of all resources because it's right at the LRAS curve. There's real GDP. Of course, there's aggregate demand, which we will label AD1. There's the short-run aggregate supply curve 1. There's long-run aggregate supply curve 1. And we could add a little 1 right in there. I forgot my 1, right? Then, of course, there is the title. That, my friends, is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 components of the neoclassical macro economic aggregate demand, aggregate supply diagram. Know these 10 components. If you make this diagram and you don't get to 10, you're missing something. Don't move on. Don't go to the next part of the question. When you get your questions, you say, oh, wow, this is, an ag this is a neoclassical aggregate demand, aggregate supply diagram. You don't have to stop reading the question draw this diagram, then go back to the question and say, oh, okay, so now something's going to happen. What's it going to be? Oh, you know, incomes in Chile went down, so there's going to be a shift inward of aggregate demand to 82. Or there's some supply side shock and the short run aggregate supply curve shifts inward. Or, you know, the government is invested in long-term education and the quantity and the quality of the factors of production have increased, or maybe there's a massive immigration into a particular country, or there's a war, so it goes in. But no matter what the second phase is, you always start with this diagram. Know it, know it well. This diagram is your best friend for the, for the rest of your life <laughs> in economics, especially at the IB level. All right, so there you go. The neoclassical macro rule of 10, know it. I hope you found this video to be helpful and we'll talk to you in a bit.